Welcome to the second video in the series on the inductive load line, or the dynamic path of operation. I'm going to describe today and discuss why the frequency, shown here on the left, this, uh, defines the shape of the ellipse or the inductive load line caused by the inductor. This video actually started off in video three, the mathematical analysis based on the work by Albert Priceman of why it is an ellipse. But in that video, for those of you who are inspiring engineers, I touch on, because I have to, quadratic equations, some derivatives, some integration, sines, cosines. It gets really kind of geeky in a heartbeat. Not some basic geekiness, but for most people, it's not, a, it's not going to be a value to you. But what you'd want out of that value is at the very end where I show you this is the equation of the ellipse. These are the equations for the, uh, the current values so you can plot them. So if you don't watch the next video, you can skip to four and five, and I'll take that equation and show you how uh, the practical application and how to plot and calculate the, the ellipse on a graph. But in this video, this is sort of an introduction to the next video, or this is going to discuss that ellipse in very general basic terms. Sixth grade math, if you will. I was reading through the book, Graphical Analysis of Electronic Circuits, published in 1969 by R.J. Maddock. Wonderful book. You need to get one. This is a triode. And a triode works by regulating the current through it. And if you regulate the current, you're going to regulate the voltage out. It's the way a triode or even a FET or a transistor works as an amplifier. Here is your B+. Plus or your, your high voltage, the maximum current is going to be regulated to some intermediate current by turning by varying the voltage on the grid from off to on. And because we have an inductor, that current can change direction. RL I want to be very specific about. RL is not the plate resistor. Let me repeat that again. It is not the plate resistor, nor is it any other resistive component upstream or downstream of this plate. RL is a resistive value in DC ohms across the winding of the inductor. If you have a speaker and you measure with a volt ohm meter the DC ohm between the two terminals for an 8 ohm non impedance in speaker, you'll get 5 to 7 ohms. At 400 hertz, the reactive nominal impedance is 8 ohms. So the difference between the 5 to 7 ohms DC and the reactive value at 8 ohms is the reactive value at frequency. You need them both. So this RL is the resistive value across the coil. We're going to vary the voltage, vary the current, vary the voltage coming out. And it looks like this. So every time the current hits passes through zero, the voltage is going to be at maximum. Goes from three, here's three, zero current, maximum voltage, maximum current, zero voltage. As I change through here, because every time Again, current goes to zero, voltage has to be at its maximum state. The equation then for the intermediate voltage coming out is VAK is equal to the B plus or the high voltage plus or minus the peak current times the frequency times the inductor value in Henry's. The only variable in this equation is omega, the frequency. At a high frequency, it's going to make that ellipse larger. Now then, I've sh shifted things vertically for you. Imagine your DC load line being vertical. And the reason I did that was to keep the current current and the voltage voltage and not have a mix. Because if I put a, a DC load line on this graph as we normally see it, and I'll show that in the last slide, 
Then I had mixed components, current, voltage, and we would spend a lot of time going, well, how much is current, how much is voltage? Forget that. DC load line's gone vertical. Now I've got current and voltage, and you can see the change in current. Here's the change in voltage and the current, how the current's going to flow through this circuit. The current flows from 3 to 2 to 4 to 1. It's flowing counterclockwise. This is going to become more important. Let me move myself over again. I seem to always be getting in my own way. DC load line, here's a current, 0 degrees, 90, 180, 270, 360. It is flowing around the ellipse. Here's your Q point, the axle of the wheel, if you will. The inductor current is lagging by 90 degrees. This is an illustration of that. When the current is zero, the voltage is peaked. When the voltage goes to zero, the current maxes out. It's 90 degrees out of phase. In videos four and five, this becomes, becomes important to understand what this represents. This is going to represent the phase angle of the current with respect to the voltage in order to make plotting and graphing make more sense, actually. It, it's for that purpose, more than just being technically correct, because we need to be able to illustrate graphically so we can visualize what clipping is doing to the sine wave, what the load distortion uh, percent of overheat and oversaturation is doing to the sine wave. Because if we cover it in some other obtuse angle, while it could be technically correct, it doesn't do anything for us visually, and we don't. If we can't see the problem, we can't address it. So these become important for a practical reason in videos four and five as well. If I lay the DC load line over into its normal position, this is where it, it, it ends up. So here's the same illustration off to the angle again. Here's my current variance. And as I vary frequency, the shape of this ellipse is going to vary as well. It's still maxing out my voltage from one extreme to the next, but the uh, ellipse is going to either get narrow or fat based on frequency alone if this were a pure inductor. And we all know now that, that we don't deal with pure inductors, unless of course you're using an inductor to base load an antenna, but for a speaker, that coil, because it's mounted to a cone, paper cone, and in a frame, it gets really ugly in a hurry. But in video four, I'm going to show you how to put this into practical application. So I hope you stay tuned for the next one. Next one's going to derive the equations for you, show you how that is derived, and show you the mathematical reason why it is an ellipse. But it's all based on this concept. Nothing's going to be violated here in the next video. We have to keep all the laws the same, but this is an introduction to the next video. And if you don't watch the next video, come back for videos four and five. I'm going to put it into practical application for you and we plot the results. I hope you found this useful. Thank you for watching.